Good evening. Welcome to Focus. I'm your host, Cindy McKee. And tonight we've got Suzanne Richmond from the Funky Chicken Farm. Suzanne is an urban farmer, she calls herself. And Suzanne, thanks for being on the show. Hi, Cindy. Glad to be here. Tell us all about your Funky Chicken Farm and what an urban farmer is. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, well, uh, we've owned and operated the farm since uh, approximately 2006. My partner, Andrew, and I run the farm, and we were both laid off in the same week. Uh -huh. And we were already doing what we do, so we decided to jump in and make it work. Um, an urban farmer is someone that raises some of their food uh, in their own backyard, no matter how big or how small it is, uh, versus a commercial farmer which farms acres and acres of land to produce food for many, many people. An urban farmer would produce food for their family. Um, I've, my father bought the farm in 1943, and then my father owned it. And then um, my father died when I was 17. So from that point on, um, my mother, my sister, and I have lived on the property. And my, it's been my dream to always be self-sustaining on that land and to use the land wisely. So we have 10 acres combined, and um, we're doing it. We are raising goats, chickens, pigs, rabbits, earthworms. Uh, we grow a garden and we raise lots of tropical fruit trees as well. And we teach other people how to do it here in our subtropical. Right, farm. right. And you put a special emphasis on, um, how should I say it, the purity of your food that you grow? I mean. Yes. Um, with today's um, food uh, consciousness, a lot of people are very concerned with the foods that they're buying from the supermarket. Um, namely, some of these foods that are grown are genetically modified, and the people who are growing this food are not required by law to tell us that it is genetically modified. So what is happening um, since about the early 1990s, this food has been appearing in our marketplace, and we as a society have been eating it since that time, and now problems are starting to occur, namely problems with digestion, um, food allergies, and um, things of this nature that are not easily explained. Um, so we're, there's a lot of people who are pointing the fingers at food. Right, and it's just not accepted into our bodies. What was it you were telling me um, about the normal chromosomes? And Yeah, for instance, wheat. Um, okay. It, it was published uh, in a book that we used to have only 16 chromosomes uh, 100 years ago. Uh, and now since we are more modern and we're hybridizing foods for production, uh, the number of chromosomes in wheat have jumped to 96. Now our bodies are not yet accustomed or adjusted to be able to uh, process this food. Right. So it becomes a foreign substance and then we start producing allergens uh, and, and antihistamines in, in relationship to this type of food and it's Right, problem. right, which is probably why so many people that we all know are coming, you know, saying they have this um, gluten reaction and they have to totally stay away from it. Exactly, exactly. Not only that, other foods such as tomatoes, for instance, some big GMO type companies are inserting uh, a gene from a fish into a tomato so that oh. it will become more cold tolerant. Well, this is foreign to all nature, and then we're expected to eat this and also not be told that we're eating it. So that makes us somewhat of an experiment, I would have to say. Yeah, yeah, you're making me feel like a laboratory <laughs> rat just <laughs> talking about exactly. it. Exactly. <laughs> and so what we encourage is for people to grow their own food at home uh, and stay with the heirloom varieties of seeds. Heirlooms are seeds that are tried and true. It's what our great-grandfathers um, have brought with them from uh, the countries such as Europe or China or Russia, and they brought to this country when they started fresh uh, in the days of the pilgrims. And they grew these varieties over and over and over again on the lands where they lived. Right. So these varieties built tolerance, uh, disease resistance, and um, they adapted to growing into local environments. And that's what we're trying to do in right. Florida. And yet genetically they were never forced to change or Exactly, right. and they changed slowly and over time, and it was a natural change. It wasn't right. a forced 
quick change right, in Right, a that. natural adaptation. Nice. Like, like we all, you know, animals, living creatures, plants, they all go through it exactly. in their environment. Mm -hmm. Yes. And so um, we encourage people to grow heirloom seed varieties for that reason. And once you start growing an heirloom seed in your own backyard, you'll realize the taste differences between that kind of food and the food that you grow in the grocery store. Um, foods, vegetables in particular, that are um, obtained at the grocery store are hybrids, meaning they have taken two varieties and they have cross-pollinated them to make uh, a superstar variety, let's just say, with better um, transportability, tougher skins, um, flesh that isn't, that's a little more firm and not so soft, mm -hmm. so bruising doesn't occur in shipping. But what happens is that they compromise flavor for this to happen. So often people have complained about the tomatoes not being very good in a grocery store, and that's one of the reasons why. That explains it. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, it, but if they've been a hybrid, is that the same as a GMO then? No, a GMO, which means genetically modified organism, means that an organism was inserted into the genetics uh, of the plant um, with very special techniques. Um, and these are foreign objects, so to speak, to the plant. This is not what occurs in hybridization where the pollen from one plant falls onto the pollen of another right. plant creating a plant. Which is more of a natural process. Exactly. It's just that we have chosen which plants we're going to exactly. cross over. Right. Mm -hmm. Genes, in the case of G GMO, are inserted into the DNA structure of the plant. So we don't know the outcome of no, to probably be. most people don't even know this is being done to our fruits and produce and, you know. Exactly. You're right, right. So, yeah. And then you said you grow it for yourself, but I know that you also <laughs> share with others. You offer it at the farmer's market. Yes, definitely. Um, um, Andrew and I have been a participant of the Brevard County Farmer's Market since the inception of the market approximately four years ago now. Right, and that's the one at Wickham Park? Exactly. Every Thursday? Every Thursday from 3 till 7. And it's a great place to find locally grown food. It's really uh, a growers only market. Each grower that brings their food there has to be certified um, by the Ag Extension Agency that mm -hmm. they are growing that food. And um, it's a wonderful little market. Yeah. Yeah, very nice. Um, I just lost my train of thought what I was going to ask you. Um, well, you can go there and meet your local farmers, um, of which in Brevard County there aren't that many of, um, but more and more um, people are becoming aware and um, people are becoming more concerned about growing more local food. Right. So is it strictly Brevard County farmers, or do others come in, say, from like Kissimmee, if you know, from the outer areas where there's um, more actually, open no, land and farming? Actually, no. This is the Brevard County only really? market. Oh, good. Uh, and the producers of the vegetables have to sell at least 75% of what they're selling has to be from Brevard County, grown in Brevard yeah, County. Yeah, great. That's great so, to know. Yeah, it is. Yeah. So you also brought some pictures of some of the things that you do at your farm. Yes, I did. Can we take a look at a couple of Suzanne's pictures? That's Andrew. Um, he is the poultry master at the farm. He's taking a break, and behind him you can see our um, chicken processing station with the scalder, the plucker, and um, some of the cones behind him. So you said he takes care of the chickens? The goats, and um, currently we have four Hampshire pigs that we're raising for food. Um, all the things that we do at the farm are for food, and we'll be happy to show people. Or and we, all, we host workshops and classes on how to do it. On how to slaughter a pig and... If you want and to know what that. to do with the meat, we're, we're leaving the slaughtering of the pigs to someone else. Oh, okay. <laughs> someone do you cure bacon and do all that too? Uh, and that also will be done by somebody else. Oh, okay. Because we're so busy. Right. You know, yeah. Doing other things. Yeah, I can imagine. But we, and you're beekeepers. Yes, I'm a beekeeper, um, and my interest about bees is just to keep them alive and have a good safe haven for them to live. And lucky for me, I live in an area that's not sprayed a lot. Uh, as far as pesticides go. So 
you know, give them a home and, and they'll stick around. Right, and, but well, and, and then you make some wonderful things from what they make, right? Oh, yes. Bees are wonderful producers of uh, beeswax, which I use in balms. Um, they also produce honey, of course. And, um, which you also sell at the farmer's market. I do. I sell mm -hmm. uh, locally grown honey from a circumference of about 100 miles. Right. You said um, you had some wonderful orange blossom honey. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> Freshly spun orange blossom honey. Uh -huh. And it's a Florida uh, tradition to get that variety. Nothing like that on a warm oh, biscuit. That's what I love. It. <laughs> Very good. Very good. Very aromatic. Uh huh. And then you make some um, wine from honey also. I do. Um, I make mead, which is honey wine, and it's the oldest fermented beverage. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, this is one of my rabbits. Um, we raise rabbits for meat. I have a rabbit tree, and this is uh, a little California bunny enjoying the springtime and the flowers. Mm -hmm. um, they're also for meat, um, and that's why we raise them. Um, but the magic about them is they produce wonderful poop for the garden. Um, oh. And the earthworms that we raise. Um, so they you make your own compost. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, the earthworms uh, consume their manure and turn it into a rich black soil that is used exclusively in the garden to produce our food. So the nutritional benefits don't get any better than that. No, no. Mm -hmm. Sure beats growing on a sandbar. Yeah, it does. <laughs> I come from Illinois, and we had beautiful black soil there, mm -hmm. and my mom used to grow the most wonderful tomatoes. Nice. Yes. Uh -huh. Very Flavorful. Good. Here's uh -huh. more of your bunnies. Yeah, this is another little Californian bunny um, just hanging out it looks, with his mother. What's behind him? Is it? Oh, with That's his mother. mother. Okay. Because they're pretty mother. good sized bunnies, it looks like. Yes, they um, will average uh, approximately 10 to 12 pounds. Yeah. Is that's all the photos we have, I guess, at this point. Okay, yeah. Okay. Great. Um, we've only got, oh, here's a, uh, your chickens, because we've only got a little bit left before we take a commercial break. Okay, um, this is uh, a day pen where you see all the chickens, and they are um, allowed to graze on the grass. This is a very lightweight pen that uh, we suggest people make to to let the chickens roam in the yard. It has a bird netting on top of it that prevents uh, airborne predators from flying down and swooping up a chicken. Mm -hmm. uh, and so they can be safely uh, grazing and uh, we wouldn't have a predator issue. And there is one more of chickens. Don't we have one more photo of chickens? 